All right, well, I'm on research leave this semester, so I'm not even around. I decided to emerge from my cave and come out this morning and talk to you for a little while. Uh, how many of you are taking New Testament history and literature? Let me just see your hands. Do any of you have that book, what the New Testament authors really cared about? Any of you have it with you? Pull it out, show everybody. I got a reason to show it to you. And if you don't, just hold it up. That's it, right there. All right, and this is up, up on the screen right here. Now, Dr. Williams and I, that is Dr. Matt Williams, he and I worked together on this book with uh, 13 or 14 other professors from across the country. We were really excited, actually, about the picture that they put on the front. This is a mosaic in modern-day uh, Berea, and it shows the Apostle Paul proclaiming the gospel to the Bereans. Now, it says in the Bible that the Bereans received the word that they studied it to make sure that, they, that what Paul was saying was correct. So, um, you know, I think Paul's a great guy, I really do. I, I would love to model my own life after him in many ways. I'm so grateful for the ministry that he had there. So when I was in Berea last year, a year and a half ago I was there, I thought, wouldn't it be great just to kind of imitate Paul? Go ahead, put it up there. I got some help from some of my friends as they were trying to act out the thing a little bit. So that is Berea, an attempt to actually imitate Paul. This thing's really boomy. Can I try this mic instead? Let's try that. All right. Is that better? Can you turn that on? Great, thank you. All right, that just felt very boomy. If you can get that thing on the right EQ, that would be great. Thanks a lot, Caleb. All right, well. We're going to be talking about Paul, and yes, I would love to imitate Paul in this regards. Paul loved the Lord. He was passionate about the gospel. We want to be passionate about the gospel ourselves, right? But how do we become passionate about the gospel? What is it that motivates a passion for the gospel? It's not enough to just talk about or sing about calling it out from the mountains or screaming it on top of the mountains. We actually have to um, embrace it, internalize it, and then know how to preach the gospel to others. So today we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Open up your Bibles. I will show it in a moment on the screen, but it won't be coming up on the screen anymore after that. So if you want to follow along, you'll have to be there. We're going to try to answer the question, why was Paul so passionate about the gospel? Not just Paul was passionate about the gospel, and so should you be, but why was he? What was it that instilled in Paul a passion for the gospel? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 11 to 15. Verse 11. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of things to abound to the glory of God. So why was Paul passionate about the gospel? Number one, because he loved Jesus Christ more than life itself. Verse 11, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. It is for Jesus' sake, and if you know this section of Scripture at all, one of the richest in all of Scripture, one I'm trying to saturate myself in right now in my own private times with the Lord, you'll know that just a little bit after that, he's going to say that the love of Christ controls him. In other words, what he does in proclamation of the gospel flows out of a deep-seated love for Christ. You see this all the time in Paul's life. He loved Jesus more than anything else. It is for his sake that he is doing what he does. There are so many examples I can give you, but just think about this one. Paul was a Roman citizen. Think how many times he was taken in by some Roman authorities or local magistrates or something. They're about to beat him. They're going to throw him in prison. They're going to threaten him, whatever it is. And Paul has to make a decision in that moment. Does he appeal to his Roman citizenship or not? How did Paul make that decision? Paul was pretty radical. He really was about Jesus. How did he make the decision at that point whether to appeal to his Roman citizenship or not? 
I'm pretty convinced that he did it based upon whether or not he thought that the gospel had a more greater likelihood of going out or not. So if he thought it would be better for the local community and for the gospel going out to take that beating, he took the beating. If he thought it was better for the sake of the gospel um, that you know he should appeal to say um, to Caesar as he did later on or tell someone like a centurion at another point that he was a Roman citizen, he did that. In other words, he lived for Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was full of Jesus. And it overflowed in his life to others. And he would do anything for that. He says that he is constantly being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Look, this is not some sort of feel-good, exchange life, mystical type thing going on in him. In this context, what he is saying is that he is putting himself out, taking God-honoring risks that he knows may actually bring physical harm to himself, may actually lead to his own death. He is giving himself over to death in his mission for Christ so that the life of Jesus will be manifested in his own life and so that God will be glorified and the gospel will go out. Now, people actually act in relationship to what they love and what they hate. There was a, an infograph that was created just recently about what people love and what they hate. hate. And actually, the way that they did this was they just looked at tweets and, um, and checked to see how many things were actually connected with the word love and the word hate. And so you learn from that what people love and what they hate, what they love more and what they hate more. So they love Amazon and Google more than they do Facebook and Microsoft. They love Taco Bell and Starbucks more than they do Burger King, McDonald's, and Wendy's. They love cycling hockey, and basketball, more than they do, don't mean to offend anyone here, running, football, and soccer. And they love BMWs, Nissans, Fords, Volvos, Mercedes, Toyotas, Hondas, virtually every car better than they love Chrysler's. And I know that very, very well. My Plymouth Voyager, do you even remember what a Plymouth was? Well, it's a version of Chrysler's, like Chrysler's without washers on their bolts. And we had a Chrysler minivan, a Plymouth minivan, that died. Our transmission went out for the third time up by Lake Tahoe on the Nevada side. My wife just wanted me to drive it into the lake and leave it there. I had vowed never to fix that transmission again. So I sold it to a mechanic on the spot for $500. Do you know what's the worst part about it? I found out later it wasn't even worth $500. I had ripped the guy off accidentally. That's how bad it was. Anyway. I hated my Chrysler. I'm so glad to be done with it. If you love someone or something more than something else, it actually changes the way you live, the way that you respond to it. I know that when I fell in love with Trudy, there were very few things I wouldn't do for her. One morning when there was a fresh snow in the Northwest, I went outside of her dorm and I stomped out a huge I love you in the fresh snow for her outside of her window. We were separated for, during our engagement for about three months. She was, she was living 400 miles away from me four times during that summer. I did that 800 mile round trip just so I could see her because I loved her. You do things because you love someone. I recently heard about a true story about a parent who ran into a burning building, saved their child, who was on the second floor, came out with extreme burns. But this parent is like, well, of course, what else would you do? Loved their child and was willing to risk a lot as a result. Our love for God will motivate a passion for the gospel. It was so in the case of Paul. Thomas Chalmers used to call this the, the expulsive power of a new affection. So let me ask you this question. Why are we so passive about the gospel? Simple answer, we love life more than Jesus. We love our clothes and we love our families. We love our status as college students and we love our video games. We love our comfort, our coffee, and our cars. If we love Jesus more than we love our lives, we would be more passionate about the gospel. This week, right at this moment, there's a trial going on in central Turkey for the three Malatya martyrs. They were martyred for Christ in April of 2007. One German man and two Turkish men. The Turkish, one of the Turkish men I knew fairly well. And um, they gave their lives for the sake of Christ. They were just bold about their proclamation. They lived on the edge like Paul did here. They lived not counting their lives as anything to themselves. 
They were passionate about the things of the Lord. You can pray for them, by the way. That, that trial is very important for the furthering of the gospel in the country of Turkey. You can pray, pray that this trial will turn out in a way that God will be glorified. That's going on right this minute. Are we loving Christ more than anything else, so much so that it actually motivates the way that we share the gospel or don't share the gospel? Do you want to become more passionate about the gospel? Then grow into a much deeper and more abiding love for Jesus. So, recap, why was Paul so passionate about the gospel? Because he loved his life more, because he loved Jesus more than his life. Second, because he believed that the gospel was true. As Francis Schaeffer used to say, he believed it was true truth. Look at 4.13. It says it specifically. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Paul passionately believed that the gospel was true. In fact, he was so passionate about it. At one point in Acts 26, the governor Festus looks up at Paul and he, it says in Acts 26, he cries out in a loud voice, Paul, you're, you're out of your mind. And what does Paul respond? He says, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of somber truth. In other words, for Paul, this wasn't just the truth or the message that needs to be, be spoken out there. It was truth with a capital T. It, it, was, it was attached to Jesus Christ, from whom all truth emanates. And he believed it was true. If we believed that the gospel was true truth, it would affect the way that we actually dealt with it. I mean, that was a strange thing in Paul's day, right? For somebody, I mean, this is a day of competing deities, lots of different philosophies, and someone comes out and says there is one truth and it is centered in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Of course they thought he was mad. That sounds a little bit similar to our day and age in that way. When I was in my PhD studies, I had to read a book by then Duke professor, uh, Stanley Fish, he was a literary theorist who wrote a book called Is There a Text in This Class? In it, he argued that there are no actual interpretations that you can get of any texts. That is, um, you only can make meaning as interpretive communities. As applied to the Bible, that means that there wouldn't be anything that you can actually get from the Bible in and of itself. It's in your community that you create meanings. This creates some sort of like strange air that you breathe. In, in California, right, we, we say, I don't want to breathe anything I can't see, <laughs> right? But, but there's this air you can't see that many of us have breathed, this postmodern world, this relativistic thinking, which, which just sucks the passion out of our lives because we don't believe that there's something that is true, true truth, somber truth, as Paul said. Our thinking becomes hazy. Our passion goes out the door when we begin to suggest that all roads lead to heaven, that there's no ultimate truth, and that, of course, Jesus is not the only way. I see this all the time. I sometimes take out, uh, a couple times a semester, I take out groups with me to go down to Cal State Fullerton. Just a simple, your professor wants to go out and share, your, share his faith along with some students. Some of you have done that with me who are in this room. And uh, we've talked to so many different people there. We've talked to atheists, we've talked to just general pluralists, and, and Hindus, and Mormons, and Muslims, and we've talked with, um, I remember talking with one girl, she described herself as an English pagan. I thought that was interesting. And with pantheists, we've talked with so many different people from different worldviews, but what's amazing is how often people simply say, yeah, well, this is what I think, but you know there's different ways to get from here to there. I hear that all the time, even from people who should know better. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just in the air. We don't believe, sorry, we don't proclaim the gospel with passion because we haven't internalized the truth to such a degree that we believe it, really, truly believe it. By the way, relativistic ideas don't work really well in certain types of arenas of life. I mean, can you imagine you open up a will after somebody has died and and they're like, yeah, I know that Aunt Martha wanted to give this money to her daughter, but we really need it for the state of California, so we're just going to take it away. That, that wouldn't work very well. We're flying a jet plane, right? The, the pilot's going, wouldn't it be fun to see if I could land this, this, this plane without the landing gear? That would be really interesting. 
or, um, or an architecture. Let's build that new building without a foundation. That wouldn't work very well. Or surgery, right? A surgeon, he says, hmm, maybe today, he's got you all kind of cut up there. Maybe we should call the heart, the liver, and deliver the kidneys and the kidneys, the heart. That would be fun, kind of language games. We could play those. That would be really interesting. It doesn't work very well, right? And yet, so I'm, I know I'm making fun of it. I realize, but, um, but we do live in a day and age where there's so much fuzziness and not a grounding in the truth of the gospel. And that's one of the reasons we're not passionate. So why are we often passive about the gospel? It's because we privately wonder whether it's true. And this doesn't just affect people who have breathed the air of relativistic thinking. I remember sitting in, in Turkey where um, my wife and I lived for seven and a half years. And I was sitting across from a guy and I was sharing the good news with him. And we were in a tea house and we're drinking tea and we're, um, we're talking about the gospel. And this guy is opening up. I remember this moment really well because of the thought process that went through in my mind. He's opening up and I began to sense this guy, he might give his life to Christ today. And right on the back end of that, I had another thought. But it better be true, Ken. Because if he does, he might be kicked out of his family. He might, from some relative, actually face physical abuse of some sort. He might lose his job. He might not be able to get another job. He might be denied educational benefits. Ken, you better believe that this is true. And then on the back end of that, the Holy Spirit. But of course, it is true. It's worth laying your life down for. In other words, when you question the truth, that is, if you don't really have a deep, your roots just deeply sunk into the Word of God and know that it's true, then your passion evaporates. Your passion for the gospel evaporates. I did end up in that situation coming out with, yes, I do believe this is true, and yes, I do believe that it's worth dying for. So, do you want to be more passionate about the gospel? Then start digging out the nagging questions in your mind. Study them. Expose yourself to the truth of God's word. And become a deep believer in the truth of the gospel. All right, let's review. Why was Paul so passionate about the gospel? Because he loved Jesus more than life. Second, because he believed that the gospel was true. And third, because he longed for the future. Look at 4.14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. In fact, there's one place in his writings in, in Philippians where he is just, he is downright struggling with whether he'd rather be in this life or with the Lord. He, he, you know, the famous verse he starts out with, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And if I'm going to go on living in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for you. I, I, I don't know what to choose. I'm hard-pressed from both directions. I desire to depart and be with Christ. That is so much better. But to remain on in the flesh is, is more necessary for your sakes. And, and convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. I'll just stop there. But you can see that he, he was longing, wrestling with um, whether or not it's better to be with Christ. He so wanted to be with Christ. In fact, he says it's better to be with Christ, but whether or not Christ for that time still had him here for a purpose, which he only described as fruitful labor. That's the only reason we're here in the first place. Have you ever longed for something, like really longed for it? Like longed to come back to Biola uh, to get away from the summer job you were working at? Or longed for your summer job after you saw, saw your syllabi for the semester? This past summer, I went to Ecuador with, a, with a, um, a team from my church. Part of what we did was some practical work. So after, after mixing cement with a shovel for three hours, I was longing to be done with that job. I can tell you what, I'm, we're not talking about those little spinny things that have uh, the cement in it. This is just sand, cement, and water on concrete that you're mixing with a hand. I was, I was longing to be done with that. I longed to be able to not leave my fiance before we were married. I longed to be able to just stay with her and not have to leave. If you ever really longed for something, if you long for heaven, if you long for that which is coming to be with Christ forever, it will motivate what you do. You will be more passionate about the gospel. So why are we often passive about the gospel? It's because we rarely even think about heaven, much less long for it. 
One of the reasons that Paul was so passionate about the gospel is that he longed for heaven, and we so often don't even think about it at all. Imagine that you're one of those people who hates to stop the car and ask for directions. By the way, how many of you can't even find your way around without your GPS? Just honestly, right? Come on, see, there we go. Whole bunch of people there. But let's, okay, so let's, let's create a scenario. You're on your way to a job interview. You really want this job, you really need this job. You're heading out there, your GPS takes you to a street that doesn't exist. Now you're running late. You can already feel the tension rising in this room as I say it, right? You really need this job. You want to be on time. You want to impress this potential employer of yours. So, but you're one of these people who hates to stop and ask someone for direction. But your desire to get to that job interview overrides your fear of stopping and asking someone for directions. That's how it is here. Your your um, desire for heaven, your thinking about being with the Lord forever will override your fear of sharing the gospel with others who need to be there with him as well. One of the main reasons we're passive about the gospel is that we don't long for the future like Paul did. Do you want to be more passionate about the gospel? Then start thinking about how short life is and how long eternity is. It will change the way that you interact with the gospel. So why was Paul so passionate about the gospel? Because he loved Jesus more than life itself, because he believed that the gospel was true, and because he longed for the future. Finally, fourth, because his ultimate aim was the glory of God. Look at 4.15. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Paul was all about the glory of God. In fact, when he faced opposition in Corinth from those that he called tongue-in-cheek the super apostles, they were really into what? Power, prestige, presentation, persuasion. Those are all good peace. He didn't praise himself. That's not what he would do. What was Paul's response to that? He says in the Corinthian letters, if I'm going to praise somebody, it's going to be the Lord. I'm not going to boast myself. If I'm going to praise anything about myself, it's going to be my own weaknesses. Twice in those letters, he quotes from Jeremiah, let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. His concern was the glory of God, not his own glory. Evan was reading from Ephesians 1, that passage, where he's talking about Christ and the centrality of Christ. But three times in that passage, it says, it's to the praise of his glory. The ultimate aim, the ultimate goal is God's glory. He was just taken with the glory and the honor and the majesty of God and didn't want anything to get in the way of it. So why are we often passive about the gospel? It's because we care more about our reputations than we do the glory of God. We care very much what people think about us. We care whether they think we're cool or hip or up to date. We care whether they think we're good looking whether they think we're nice, we care whether they think that we're intelligent, we care what other people think about, and we think a lot about what other people think about us. Let me tell you one thing. You know, people actually think less about you than you think that they think about you. Think about that for a minute. It's totally true. If we would learn to live for another person's glory far more than our own, it would change our orientation, our relationship to the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you all remember reading about, you won't, most people in this room actually won't have been born at this point, but what, what um, Sports Illustrated called the most, the most significant sports moment in the 20th century, that's what we call Miracle on Ice, 1980, when our hockey team, our Olympic hockey team, went out, there's a bunch of like um, amateurs and college um, hockey players went out and took on the most powerful teams in the world, particularly the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union, we ended up playing just before the finals, but they, they, were, they were, I don't remember, it was something like two and a half decades they had won every major international competition. And this group of guys goes out there, and they just start beating up on people. It was amazing. Nobody, people who had never watched hockey before started watching hockey. I, did you know that when I was growing up, people didn't really watch hockey? It was after that that hockey became a much more popular sport. But those guys were playing with a passion, and it was not just a passion to win a gold medal. And you'll remember your history. That was the middle of the Cold War. 
right there. There was this arms race that was going on between the United States and between the Soviet Union. And, um, and winning each game, heading toward playing against the USSR, was a lot like winning battles heading toward this great war that was going on at that time. So these guys, they were playing for the glory of another. And anyone who was there will remember, it was the glory of the United States of America. That was what was f they were focused on. They played passionately because they were focused on that glory. And that's what happens to our passion also. It increases as we focus on the glory of God. But we don't think much about the glory of God. We're into our own reputations. Oh, brothers and sisters, love the glory of God. Learn how to live in the glory of God for the honor of God, especially as shown to us through Jesus Christ. Now, toward the end of this message, I want to turn it around just for a few minutes. It's not simply that you are motivated to share the gospel by the four things that I've talked about here, though that is in fact true. Interestingly enough, if you share the gospel, if you open your mouth and talk to other people about it, it will actually impact your relationship to these four things as well. In other words, do you want to love Jesus more? Go out and start sharing the gospel. Open your mouth, talk to someone about Jesus. Do you want to believe in the truth of the gospel more than you ever have before? Then start talking with others. You'll find out whether you really believe or not. Do you want to long more for the future? Well, start sharing with people. When you see someone come to faith, it will ex excite you and an insight in you, a love for Jesus and for what's coming in the future. Do you want to have a greater focus on the glory of God? Start talking to, Je start talking to other people about Jesus, and that will increase as well. When I was in college on Friday nights, a group of, a group of friends of ours uh, uh, living up in Portland, Oregon, we would go down to um, downtown Portland and just talk with people on the streets about the gospel. By the way, for any of you who are skeptical about that whole thing, thinking, oh, we shouldn't go out on the streets, we shouldn't just talk to people about the gospel, read your Bibles, please. People did it all the time in the, in the Bible. Anyway, we went down there and uh, we'll just talk with people. I remember how difficult and uncomfortable it was at first. Eventually, I just, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, I'd walk up to someone and I heard friendship evangelism was important. So I'd be like, hey, how are you doing? Like trying to make a friend. They're like, oh, this guy's weird. So um, I eventually uh, just went to, hey, we're talking to people about Jesus. Would you like to talk with us? And they'd either say yes or no. And if they said no, we, we said, okay, thanks. Have a great day. If they said yes, you had a wide open door. We just shared the gospel with them. And that was great, but I remember what happened to me and the friends that went out there. We became so much more passionate about our faith, just as a simple result of opening up our mouths and talking to people. And here, there's so many opportunities. We have a beach. You can go talk to people there. Uh, we've, got, we've got schools around there, our public areas. You can go talk to people. And this is not all you do, of course, in proclaiming the gospel. The goal is that you'll share with your friends, but this can give you courage. It can give you training, give you help to learn how to share with your friends and your neighbors, which is really what you want to do. But you open up your mouth and you share with others. Last semester, I took down um, some people down to Cal State Fullerton, and there was a group of guys in one of my classes that, that really appreciated it, and so they decided to go out themselves. So they went down there five or six more times, and I could just see, you could visibly see what God was doing and, and strengthening these guys in their faith because they were doing this. Um, these are things that you can do as well. Uh, the the um, California School Project, they're off and out sharing their faith. Yeah, that's right, it's a big group here. Um, they didn't pay me to say that, by the way, but that's a, that's a good group. Let me just give you one story in closing. I went out with a group, um, I don't know, maybe three years ago, and I, I just happened to put people into, um, and I put one group together of three girls, and I didn't realize this, who had never done anything like this before, had never shared their faith with anyone before. They told me about it later, and they were at Cal State Fullerton, and they're walking around together saying, we're supposed to do this. This is, this is what we agreed to do. Our teacher's giving us extra credit. And, uh, okay, we got to talk to someone who's going to do it. No, you do it. Oh, no, no, you do it. And finally, they see this guy sitting over there on, um, on a little wall, and they say, okay, we're going to go talk to him. And they walk up to this guy, and they just begin to have a conversation with him, and he immediately, his eyes are like saucers. He's listening, he's open, he's attentive, he's wide open. 
they, they talk with him, they share with him for a while, and finally he says to them, you know, just as you were walking up, I was praying. I don't really pray very much, but I, was, I, I just prayed. Because I've been going to the Christian club on campus here, and I was interested for a while in what they were saying, but I've been starting to pull off to that. And I was thinking of not going anymore. So I just said to God, God, if you're really there, show me. Maybe somehow show me that you care about me. You guys just walked up. They had a great conversation. The guy committed himself to continue going on to this Christian club there. And um, they had a wonderful time. And these girls were so strengthened in their lives with the Lord. Open up your mouths. Take the risk. And you'll become much more passionate about Jesus Christ. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.